Can't get enough of Kelly and Rumya? We're now on YouTube for you to indulge in highlights from our show. Folks, we want to welcome in Fern Lullum from the UK for our bi-weekly check-in. What's on your mind? I'm Fern Lullum from the UK, and whether serious, silly, or somewhere in between, I've got you covered. Let's face it, the most effective therapy is a chat with your bestie. Well, we're going a little serious, Fern, today on the program as we get into the sensitive conversation around why you might doubt that you're good enough to succeed in the things that matter to you most. You may have heard of this being referred to as imposter syndrome. Fern, so many of us struggle with imposter syndrome in one form or another. So I'm really curious, what were what made you want to bring this up to the show? Yeah, I mean, I think it is such a universal um, concept. You know, it's something that so many of us, as you said, do struggle with, and certainly something that I've had personal experience of in my life before. So I thought, let's delve into this one in a little bit more detail and see if we can you know, sort of change our mindset a little bit on how much potential we really have. That is, of course, if you think that I'm the right person to be talking about this because, you know, maybe I'm just not good enough. Oh. Maybe, maybe, maybe. We'll consider we that as we go through. You're not through, supposed to agree, sure. Kelly. We think you're uh-huh. good. <laughs> well, well, we'll see because, Fern, I mean, I don't know enough yet, so I'm looking at what are the common signs of and symptoms of imposter syndrome. That one, Help what she out. just did. That's a comment. You're, you're yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, that's right. right. Well done, Remy. I think one of them yeah. is using humor as a defense mechanism, um, which I'm very familiar with. So uh, there's as two I've now. Just demonstrated. There's two. <laughs> yes, yeah. exactly. Um, but, you know, so imposter syndrome, if you've heard of it before, you'll know that it's all around kind of feeling a bit of a fraud. Like, I've got into this position, you know, usually it's often talked about in relation to work. So let's say I've got this job, but I probably shouldn't be here. And at some point I'm going to get found out and I'm, everyone's going to think that I'm inadequate and, you know, I didn't deserve it. And, you know, I've kind of snuck in the back door, but I shouldn't really be in this position because I'm not worth anything. And it basically what it relies on is this persistent self doubt that we have underneath the surface, which is actually way more about us than it is about anyone else around Mm. us but Mm -hmm. we kind of project that onto everyone else and kind of see everyone as a bit of a threat to our identity and to our worth because what if they see what i think about myself wow well it's interesting you say this especially being found out i remember once doing an interview and off mic uh, with with a, a very well known Canadian actor here, uh, and we were having that chat, and that he said was one of the biggest things through his career, and it didn't go away. He'll have moments where he stops and says, "Gosh, what if people find out? Mm-hmm. Find out that I don't belong here?" But as if he was some charlatan. Yeah, and I think that's such a great point that you bring that up because even people who are at the top of their game, mm-hmm. you know, these are people that we look up to and think, you're amazing, you must think the world of yourself because look what you've achieved. Even those people yeah. have these thoughts and feelings, so it's very, very normal. And I'm, I'm curious about stepping from that side of things into the side of just being humble and having humility. So anyways, we may or may not get to that, but let's talk about how imposter syndrome shows up typically. Yes. So we sort of think about it in terms of when I think about imposter syndrome, I think it's a lot about control, because if you have this fear of I'm going to be found out, we want to try and mitigate that somehow. So we get into the area of things like perfectionism and overachieving and overcompensating because let's remember that we don't think we're enough when we have imposter syndrome so we've got to try and do everything we can to try and get to the point where we feel enough so it's kind of like the the image of you know um a swan paddling very very furiously under the water you know on the surface it looks serene but we actually don't we need to do something to prove our worth so it looks like a lot of you know no boundaries just accepting everything and saying yes i can do that i can do that i can do that and very often what comes along with that is a fear of feedback Uh because we are so scared that somebody is going to say actually that wasn't the best thing you've ever done and our fragile egos as people with imposter syndrome we can't we can't risk that because that's scary that will make us completely come undone because what it does is we're not seeing it as oh that's constructive criticism we're seeing that as it's confirmation that 
all of my worst fears yeah. have completely come true and I'm not good enough. I knew it. Mm. And, and that's tough on accepting praise, awards, just any recognition where it's yeah. almost like you're afraid someone's going to show up and say, give me that trophy. That doesn't belong to you. Um, Fern, what are some strategies for overcoming imposter syndrome? So as I always say, with so many things, the first thing to do is to kind of acknowledge that that is what you're doing, which is hard when mm. you kind of just feel like, but it's the truth. You know, you you. it's hard to acknowledge, actually, I'm not thinking about this in a healthy way, or I'm thinking about it in a distorted way. So, you know, when we're comparing ourselves to other people, which is a common factor when we think about imposter syndrome, we think well, this is just true. I'm just not as good as this person. But actually, we can't see that we're looking at it in a skewed way. So really examining what are the feelings and what are the thoughts that I'm having here? And can those be challenged? You know, when we're saying things like, oh, I'm just not good at anything. I shouldn't be here. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm going to, you know, everyone's going to laugh at me or think I'm stupid. Is that true? Are there examples where the opposite of that has been true, where actually you've been amazing and you've got great feedback and people have thought a lot of you? Really kind of challenging that gently. And then also being able, you, you mentioned there, Kelly, about dismissing achievements and things that you have done well, actually being able to internalise that and saying, you know, of course, there is the point that you made, Ramya, about you can go too far the opposite way and just mm -hmm. say, I'm absolutely fantastic all of the time. But I think for most of us, we fall on the opposite end of that spectrum. We only pay attention to the things that weren't so good or didn't go so well, yep. and we forget all of our successes. So what I always encourage people to do is... You know, like how people make um, a gratitude journal sometimes. Mm -hmm. Another thing to do is just to write down some things every now and then that you're proud of, that you actually think, I am really happy that I did that. And it might not be a massive achievement. It just might be, I just did something nice for someone today. We need those reminders because our brain is wired to the negative, right? So we need to try and redress that balance somehow. So making a note of it, writing it down to have it so that we can go back and read it later. That's a really useful thing. And it's helpful that you say it that way, that you frame it, that we all have to some degree, um, you know, this relatability and understanding that we, we stick to the negative or that one thing that somebody said that was negative feedback or constructive feedback uh, will be what nags at us compared to all the great things and successes that we ourselves can can find and like actually keep track of um yeah absolutely because yeah. our, our brain is wired to you know seek threats and that's why it's exactly. trying to protect us but actually it's it's kind of hurting us in the process sometimes for sure for sure and we can be aware of that which is the first part of being helpful as you said so like a lot of the stuff that you said, Fern, um, could just be inside our heads, inside our minds, and we may not even be projecting too many signs of this stuff unless other people are looking for it. So what are some triggers or situations that can tend to exacerbate imposter syndrome? Okay, so here is where I, I want to go back to the fact that we kind of can get into a situation where we have a bit of a confirmation bias. And that is where basically we believe something and we believe it very strongly so that everything that happens, we just go, see, that's proof. So, of course, you can imagine a massive trigger for someone who has imposter syndrome can be when somebody actually just says, oh, um, you know, you, you, that was a great paper, but maybe how about if you change that around and do that and do this? And they're just giving, you know, helpful suggestions. And like I said earlier, to, to lots of people, that would just be great and useful and just learning. But to someone with imposter syndrome, that can be really triggering because they don't hear that's pretty much, you know, 99% amazing, but there's just a few things that you could do to make it even better. They hear you are useless. You know, everything that you believed about yourself is 100% true. And you, sh you don't deserve to be here. You don't deserve a place, you know, either in our job, in our friendship group, whatever. And of course, that can be extremely triggering. And then the opposite end of that, like we've talked about, another thing that is really hard is when 
you actually do do something really well and you get success and that can be triggering too because then it's kind of like oh god now I've got to try and keep up with this and and mm -hmm. people are gonna have really high expectations of me now because I've done really well and can I can I do that again and so it just kind of continues in this cycle of anxiety and dread and, and it can kind of just spiral out of control a little bit mm. yeah Fern what about performance at work how can imposter syndrome affect you there and your personal well-being yeah well this is where like i say it it get it can get stressful it can cause a lot of anxiety like i said about you know overcompensating and just not having any boundaries you know that can lead to burnout because you're just so intent on trying to convince everyone that you're worth something that you're putting yourself last all the time and of course that breaks your trust with yourself so you know i really encourage self compassion around this because if we're always putting ourselves last, then it's really going to have a big impact on our self-esteem, on how we see ourselves and all of that kind of thing. And on top of that, I think it makes it really hard to work with other people because a big factor of imposter syndrome is control, that element of I can't let other people see the truth. So I'm going to have to do everything here because I don't want to relinquish my control and let somebody in and potentially see through me or maybe they'll make me look bad and then everyone will know the truth. And wow. one last thing we can get to quickly is just if we notice imposter syndrome uh, being projected from somebody else, how can we support? I think normalize it. What we said about, you know, it happens to even the top people it's so normal just listen to that person without judging them don't try and fix their problems but just let them explore it with you and lead by example because we all give great advice to other people sure. but then we do the opposite ourselves so that's what i mm -hmm. challenge people to do is actually if you're giving them advice try and take that advice and show them don't tell them what to do Mm. Yes, exactly. Lead by the example. Thanks, Fern. Always great topics. Thanks for watching. You can catch Kelly and Rumya weekdays from 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern on AMI.